Welcome everybody to our session tonight uh, with Mr. Colby and the subject is his book which I think some of you have read, uh, The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in an Age of Great Power, uh, Competition or, or Conflict. Uh, he is the co-founder and the principal of the Marathon Initiative which is a, uh, a policy initiative focused on developing strategies to prepare the United States for great power competition. Let's talk a little bit about his background, which is extensive. There are few who can match his background and experience in national security affairs. Let me begin with 2018-2019, when he was the, the Director of, De of Defense Programs at the Center for New American Security. 2017-2018, to uh, Mr. Colby was the Deputy Ass Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and force development within uh, the Department of Defense. While there, he was the principal designer and architect of the national defense, the 2018 National Defense Strategy. But that was preceded by, or the NDS, the National Defense Strategy, was preceded by the national, uh, the, the president's national the national strategy. And Mr. Colby was the DOD representative to the president's office to develop the national strategy, uh, again, with a focus on, uh, counter on, on global power competition as opposed to the Middle East and counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations. Earlier in his career, he's worked on arms control, weapons of mass destruction, intelligence matters, and, and oh, by the way, he volunteered and was a participant in Iraq with the Coalition Provisional Authority in the year 2003. It is our pleasure to welcome Bridge Colby this evening. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank, thank you very much, Robbie, for that, uh, that very kind introduction. And it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be, to be introduced by, by you, given your uh, distinguished record in, in the Navy and in industry uh, and, and over many years. And I know your important role here. So I'm grateful for the intro introduction. And it's really a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, to be uh, a, a sort of a, uh, early through the, through the gates of reopening uh, in-person events. I've actually been on a book tour, and I'm actually thinking this could be my first in-person event. I've probably done several dozen events at this point, but they've almost all been virtual. So, hey, people are actually there. I'm not sure whether they're just pixels on a screen and making people are making me feel good, but this is, this is for real. And I know, you know, in this in this crowd, um, uh, in, in, in the Baltimore Council on Foreign, Foreign Affairs, uh, given, uh, you know, obviously the, the greater Washington area, there's a tremendous amount of depth in, uh, in foreign policy, foreign affairs, international affairs, but also the government as well. So I'm really looking forward, uh, of course, to, to hearing myself speak for a little bit, but then also to hearing, uh, hearing for a change from, from, from you all in, in person. So with that, I thought maybe I'd open up with a few remarks uh, based on, on my book, uh, uh, which, I, which Robbie has and which came out. Uh, a couple of months ago from, um, uh, and it's available on Amazon and, uh, and other, other sources, although the, the inflation uh, and supply chain problems have afflicted the, the publishing industry as everything else. But I, I hear the, the problems have now worked out, but, but, uh, uh, and, then, and then look forward to, to some questions uh, from, from the audience, uh, whether in person or virtual. But um, the basic impetus behind uh, writing this book for me is building actually on my experience in the Pentagon, but is my profound concern about, in, in reality, despite what these strategies have said, the, the national defense strategy as well as the national security strategy, a fundamental mismatch uh, between the sort of grand and defense strategies that America is in practice pursuing on the one hand and our actual power in the international system on the other. Um, in practice, the United States seems to be basically continuing to pursue a strategy of heavy global engagement and a significant presence, particularly in all three key theaters 
of world politics other than the United, North America itself, which are Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Yet the reality is that we, don't, we just don't have the over, overabundance of power for that heavy global presence in all of these theaters that we did. We're no longer as dominant as we were in the, in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. We're no longer in what uh, Charles Krauthammer memorably called the unipolar moment. Now, this is above all because of the rise of China, which is now as large or by some measures a larger economy uh, than the United States. Moreover, the share of global power is shifting away from established U.S. allies. So the United States is expected to roughly maintain, I think, a relative share of global GDP. But I was actually very struck uh, by uh, the prognosis for Europe, and I'll get, that, get to that in a second. But actually, Europe r right now comprises about 25 percent of global GDP. But actually, the, the EU foreign policy supremo himself, Joseph Borrell, said in an article today that in 20 years, Europe will be only 10 percent of global GDP. So there is a fundamental shift in the global kind of geoeconomic and thus geopolitical map. So in this context, we have to ask ourselves, what should our grand strategy be? And there is a debate about that. But in particular, what should our defense strategy be as an outgrowth of our grand strategy, of our overall st foreign policy strategy? And this is especially important now because, as I've indicated, we can't simply overwhelm all of the potential threats that we might imagine. Uh, out there with an overabundance of resources. And I'll take a little shot at, you know, John Bolton would give you a different perspective. John Bolton would tell you we can. It's a matter of will that we can, you know, take on every opponent in the international system. But I don't think this is a credible or realistic approach. Uh, and I would say this to Mr. Bolton himself if he were here, so I don't think I'm being unfair. Um, but we, neither can we just kind of keep muddling through and trying to hedge and kind of um, make the best of it. Uh, if we don't make choices, I think we risk overextension and we risk defeat, including in war, and I think we risk catastrophe, and I'll get into this uh, a little bit more as to how. And in this context, we must make hard calls. We must make decisions in this situation of constrained resources and in, in the, what the economists call scarcity when you don't have, you can't simply overwhelm your problems. Now, in this context, a strategy is really important. And, and this is kind of why I wrote the book. Now, what I mean by a strategy, though, is not some clever master plan or a kind of Byzantine plan that will, you know, take us through a labyrinth and get us out the other side. Rather, a strategy in this context is a framework. It's a simplifying logic with which to make choices, uh, sort of an optimize, and to prioritize. Without such a logic, there's no coherent way to tell what's important and what's not what's a threat and what's not. And in the situation of scarce resources in which we now find ourselves, that's an invitation to disaster. I mean, you can think of this as very analogous to a business. I mean, if you're a business, you know, if you go back to Porter's rules or what have you, if you face market, you know, threats to your market share and you don't have an, an, an infinity of resources to deal with the problem, you have to make decisions about what business lines you're going to invest in, what areas are you going to invest in, and so forth and so on. It's a similar situation for us. Now, what is that logic? That I, that I recommend. Well, first of all, I think it's critical that a defense strategy must proceed from an overall grand strategy that's itself sound. Now, in this respect, it's important that we reroute our grand strategy and, by extension, our defense strategy in sort of fundamentally and grounded principles of what our foreign policy should be about. I think we've become detached from that sense over the last generation. A lot of this is sort of a hubris that arose, you know, in that unipolar moment when we thought we could kind of you know, democratize the world or root out every threat that might emerge to the American people and so forth, and, and that we can't, we can't afford that anymore. So my argument in this context is the basic purpose of American foreign policy, and this, this is actually kind of a, an older uh, idea, um, but I think it needs to be reemphasized, is to ensure that no other state can dominate any of the key regions of the world, and by this I mean as one of the areas with concentrated wealth and power. Uh, this is the best way to protect Americans' prosperity, freedom, and ultimately security, because if a state could dominate one of these critical regions, it could use this enormous leverage to coerce others, including, if strong enough, the United States itself. And I think uh, this is not, this is not a, a, a pure speculation. This is something that could certainly happen. And in practice, what are these regions? Well, they're Asia, Europe, North America itself, essentially exclusively because of the United States, our economy is far, far larger than anyone else in our neighborhood. And then more narrowly, the Persian Gulf, which is much smaller but has concentrated in oil and gas reserves. Now, this is not inherently, I mean, God didn't create the earth this way, uh, per se. Uh, but um, if you look at a map 
you know, and you can, and there's actually a number, you can, you can look at, it, at a map of economic, you know, GDP, for instance, and you'll see it's very concentrated still in a few key areas. I mean, North America, particularly the coasts, uh, Europe, uh, particularly kind of Northwestern Europe, uh, especially, but, you know, Europe in general, and then East Asia and Southeast Asia, and then increasingly uh, the Indian subcontinent. In fact, if you look at, I think, maps of light, yes, Donald Rumsfeld used to like to point the light of the Korean, you know, the, at night, the Korean Peninsula at night, you know, and South Korea is brilliantly lit up and North Korea is dark. But actually, if you do that, I think on the globe, there's actually a similar effect where you can see where economic activity is concentrated. And these are the key regions of the world. Now, if you look at it this way, by far the most important of the world regions is Asia. Asia now constitutes well over 40% of global GDP, and that share will almost, will very likely exceed 50% before long. Uh, Europe is second at roughly 25%, but as I said, that share is declining and actually rapidly, both because of Europe's anemic economic growth, but also fundamental demographic issues. Now, if a state could dominate one of those regions, especially Asia, which would be half of global GDP, it could use that power to coerce uh, uh, Americans, and I think uh, is a very reasonable prospect uh, it would. And I'm happy to talk more about how and why that, that might be the case, but I think we can kind of see it uh, happening before us. And so if we look at the world in this way, we see that Asia is not only the most important region of the world, it's also where the world's most plausible regional hegemon is, which is China. China constitutes roughly half of Asia's uh, total power, if you, you know, use standard measures of economic power, military power, and so forth. It therefore stands a real chance of becoming predominant there. It's the world's other superpower. I mean, basically, there's the United States, which is about 20 to 25 percent of global GDP and power, and China, which is now about 20 to 25 percent of global GDP. Um, Russia, by contrast, despite you know, having a significant nuclear arsenal, is not even the most powerful state in Europe. Germany is actually more powerful in terms of GDP and so forth, while Iran comprises only about a fifth of the power of the Middle East. So together, these factors, by deduction, mean that denying China hegemony over Asia must be the cardinal objective of U.S. foreign policy. Asia is the world's most important region, and China its most plausible regional hegemon. Now, more to the point, the evidence, I think, before all our eyes indicates China is indeed seeking regional hegemony, if not more. I mean, I think given how Xi Jinping has just elevated himself to a whole new status, I mean, I, I like to sort of joke, but it's true that before I can come up with new examples, Xi Jinping and, the, and China produce new examples of how they have the domineering ambitions. And so it's like, I don't even, you know, just don't listen to me, just look at the facts. Um, on the other hand, this isn't actually particularly surprising. Every rising great power in history has sought a kind of dominant position uh, in this way. Of course, you could say the United States did, um, you know, Germany and imperial Germany, uh, France in an earlier period, Britain created a large empire over which it had an ascendant position, which we had our problems with uh, and separate ourselves from, but they, they managed to keep it going without us. And so there's actually little reason to expect China uh, not to follow this pattern with all its advantages. But just because it's natural doesn't mean it's acceptable to us. Uh, to the contrary, you know, we don't want this to happen. And I think just to give it a, a concreteness, okay, so if China dominated Asia, how would that change our lives in practice? Well, I think we have become very accustomed to being the preeminent economy in the world, the preeminent geopolitical and geoeconomic actor. So the dollar is the supreme currency, which means that what our Federal Reserve decides implicitly, probably with some political influence at some level, if we're going to be realistic about it, uh, from the American people, is what, is what you know, other countries have to deal with what we do. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's our uh, Congress and administrative agencies and state legislatures that determine the regulations that set the tone for the world. I mean, my favorite example of this is lots of people have problems with how the social media companies behave and how they're governed across the political spectrum. The premise of the debate that we're having in our country about the social media companies, though, is that people can elect a certain coalition in Washington or in the state capitals, and they will be able to change the way the social media companies behave. Now, if China is dominant over Asia, which is, again, over half of, glo uh, fifth, uh, half of global GDP, those social media, American social media companies will, um, will certainly not be the dominant ones. It, to the extent that Americans are still using American uh, social media companies, those companies will be accountable or subsidiaries or owned indirectly or directly by, by Chinese companies, which will be accountable to Beijing, or we'll just be using Chinese apps and Chinese companies. And we know what they do with Chinese apps. They collect all your data. There are no privacy, I mean, privacy protections like are laughable. No, they don't even, they don't have, they don't even, I don't think they even pretend. And they have a social capital score, which they use, you know, basically they take your uh, Amazon equivalent. I mean, forget about like Twitter or LinkedIn where you actually post things. They actually look at 
what you're buying, what you're, you know, where you're going, who you're talking to, to create a social capital score that's totally within their technological capability to produce, and that's how they treat you. That's the, so that's the future. That's how they treat their own people, and China is a famously nationalistic and patriotic company, uh, country. So I think it bears, you know, it, it bears, uh, it's a reasonable assumption to presume that they would treat us not more generously than they're treating themselves. So that's the future that we have to look at. And I, that's actually, my, my assessment of the future of a, of a dominant China, I think is actually more conservative analytically than many people. I mean, some people think that they're gonna come over and try to make us communists. I think that's unlikely, very unlikely. But some people think that. So it's actually, my assessment is probably less dire than a lot of people uh, in, in, in who kind of know about the, the, uh, the Chinese. So anyway, so that's what we want to avoid. Okay. So how should we try to avoid uh, this goal, but in ways that are consistent with our willpower, the gravity of our interests in this, in this uh, goal, and our strength? And I think it's really important to emphasize this part uh, about consistent with our willpower, strength, and the gravity of our interests. This is critical, and it's something we've lost the thread on, I think, in the last generation. Because denying China regional hegemony over Asia is a very, very significant American interest, as I've indicated, but it is not truly existential. I mean, we could live reasonably freely in a China-dominated world, right? So it's not a matter of national survival. So our strategies to deal with this problem, to head off this problem, need to be proportioned to this reality. So we have a very, very, very strong interest in it. But this means that we can't have strategies for what is a very important but not existential interest that involve existential sacrifices. Rather, we need strategies, and in particular defense strategies, given that they involve, let's be clear, killing and dying in large numbers, that are reasonably proportioned to the interests at stake. So in that light, what is the right strategy for America to deny China regional hegemony? The core of the answer is pretty basic, but it bears, you know, explicating, is an anti-hegemonic coalition. That is a more or less formal grouping of nations banding together to resist China's dominance of Asia. Now, I think it's important to emphasize that this coalition can take any number of forms and members. The natural candidates for such a coalition include Japan, India, Australia, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so forth. The point is there just need to be enough states working together to outweigh China and the coalition that favors its dominance of the region because some countries in the region are likely to actually want or prefer a dominant China over the alternatives, countries like Pakistan and Cambodia, and you can get into that if you're interested. <clears throat> now, we're already kind of making progress in this direction, but I stress that it doesn't need to be what, for instance, there's something called the Quad of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India that's taken forward. That, that's, a, that's a positive step, but it doesn't need to be, and it doesn't need to be an Asian NATO. It could take any number of forms, and those forms could be implicit. They, they might be informal. Again, it's simply, the condition is simply that enough states be working together meaningfully to deny China's hegemony over Asia, and that it be resilient to whatever strategy Beijing pursues to that end. Now, the U.S. role in this coalition is critical. Think of it as the external cornerstone balancer. Why is this role so important? This is not necessarily obvious. Um, I'm not somebody who thinks, and again, to pick on Mr. Bolden, but he's, a big, he's definitely a big boy. I don't think that it's necessary to have a great country and to be, for America to be its best self that we be a leader in the world. I don't think that's inherently necessary. For the first century and a half of our existence, we were not leaders in the international system. And of course, America had a lot of problems, as we do now. But we were a free society uh, on the whole, certainly relative to all the, 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 the alternatives. Um, in fact, in a lot of ways, the ideal for the United States would actually be to disengage, to sit back and let others bear the responsibilities, costs, and risks of balancing China, to free ride, if we were to be selfish about it. We were actually basically able to do this, again, in the first century and a half of our history. We basically let Great Britain and others worry about the balance of power in what was then the key theater, which was Europe, uh, while we did actually what China tried to do. We did what hide and bide. We kept a low profile. We grew, we, we, we extended across the continent. We we're not very nice to Mexico, but we, you know, we, we basically be, you know, pursued our manifest destiny, quote unquote, and then we entered the international system. The problem is that this free rider passive approach is very unlikely to work to deny China regional hegemony over Asia. And the reason is that China is just too strong relative to the other states in the region. No other state is anywhere near as strong as we are in Asia. Uh, 
you know, other than China, and thus plausibly could lead a coalition to balance against China. Each state would be too vulnerable to China's strength and its, its anger. And this is especially because China itself has a naturally good strategy to defeat any anti-hegemonic coalition, what I think of as a focused and sequential strategy. This is a strategy of focusing on and isolating members of this coalition in sequence, progressively weakening this coalition until Beijing can establish its dominance of the region. Basically, think of trying to pick apart elements of this coalition and then essentially causing a run on the bank of perceptions that this coalition will work. Uh, in other words, Beijing's strategy is unlikely to be precipitating a massive war or showdown with, that will array all of its potential opponents against it at the same time. This would, could very well lead to its defeat, probably would at this point, and at minimum would incur great cost and risk. I mean, this is what Germany did in World War II, and of course that's not a good idea if you're thinking about uh, you know, pursuing your national self-interest. So instead, Beijing is more incentivized to go after coalition members one by one, or in kind of small groups, progressively weakening the coalition until, until it falls apart. And the analogy I think of, and historical analogies are always imperfect, but the analogy I think of is what Bismarck was able to do in the 1860s and 1870s, very rapidly shift the geopolitical map of Europe, which was again the central theater of the world at the time, through a series of short, sharp wars, first against Denmark, then against Austria, and then against France, really radically changed the map without, without a large-scale war. But the effect of it was as if there had been a large-scale war that had happened. And the problem here is that if states in Asia think they will be vulnerable to China's focused and sequential strategy, that they will essentially be able to be isolated and put under Beijing's microscope and beaten into submission and punished for their recalcitrance, they are much more likely to decide to cut a deal with Beijing, to bandwagon is what the uh, academics call it. But basically, you know, it's in human nature, right? Reasoning that, well, if I'm going to be not effectively defended and from Beijing's, you know, focused ire, I better, cut, better off cut a deal. I'd prefer to have autonomy and not be under Beijing's thumb, but that's not really the choice I have. I, I'm better off cutting a deal. And this is a very real challenge, particularly in Asia. Lee Kuan Yew, the former uh, longtime prime minister of, of Singapore in his memoirs, he had a kind of cutting remark about Thailand, but I think it applies to a lot of countries in general, but certainly in Asia. He said that Thailand bends before the wind blows. He was basically remarking that the Thais would kind of cut a deal with whoever was ascendant. First, they cut a deal with the British to save their necks. Then when the, the Japanese became ascendant, they cut a deal with the Japanese, and then the Americans became ascendant, and we have had a good relationship with Thailand. Now they're kind of tilting towards China. So, I mean, I don't mean to pick on Thailand in particular, but it's a, kind of an illustrative example of how countries will kind of go where the wind is blowing. Okay, so how do we deal with this problem? Again, consistent in a way that's, you know, not, not, doesn't require us to do things that are crazy. So a key part of the solution of getting states to stand, stand up to Beijing in the face of this strategy is alliances. Now, alliances, I want to stress, are something different than just being in a kind of loose, informal coalition together. Alliances are strong signals of resolve, particularly by a cornerstone balancer like us, to fight effectively to defend another state. What they do is they provide queasy, nervous states with the confidence that they will be defended by the big heavy in particular. This is the relevant kind of format here, uh, you know, by the United States against China. So in effect, we can think of them as the steel in the spine of the anti-hegemonic coalition. But the problem with alliances, so this is the benefit, but the problem is that they also entangle. That's their whole point, right? They're like a costly signal. I mean, it's like, you know, getting married or something, right? I mean, it's it's a vow. You know, it's not the exactly equivalent, obviously, but it's something that's very a meaningful commitment. They put the cornerstone balancer's credibility on the line so that it has a real incentive to fight. But if it doesn't fight and doesn't fight effectively, then its credibility will suffer. That's the stake. And the reality is that credibility does matter. Now, American credibility, I don't think, I don't think countries think about it in some kind of undifferentiated macro sense, like if America doesn't do something over there that's totally distinct that it w won't be believed over here. But I think what, <clears throat> what, where our credibility matters is in a more differentiated sense. Now, nervous states in Asia are naturally going to wonder whether the United States is actually going to come to their aid, given how strong China is and the cost that China can impose on them. Uh, America's interests at the same time in Asia are important but partial, and China can do a lot of damage, not only to Asian states but to us ourselves. Right, so they can really hurt us, and this is becoming more clear as they build up their nuclear forces, for instance. So America might say it's committed, but are we? Are we really committed, or are we bluffing? 
Uh, this is the point that the president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, has impolitely but accurately raised. He's actually very justified in raising this concern. Now, if these nervous states, Asian states, which again, would like to be autonomous, but don't want to be crushed, see America balk at defending a country against China that Washington is allied with, particularly in Asia, they will quite reasonably wonder whether they too will be left out to dry if the going gets too tough for America. Now, this is different than the saying that the U.S. has to follow through on every commitment. Now, my view is that the U.S. can, in fact, must get out of commitments in the Middle East, like Afghanistan, for instance, and countries in Asia will be able to differentiate that from their fate vis-a-vis -vis China. In fact, reducing in other theaters like the Middle East will demonstrate our seriousness about our Asian commitments by showing that we are willing and able to focus our efforts and resources. Now, I think the withdrawal from Afghanistan was catastrophically handled, and we have a reason to, to expect that it should have been handled better, but the decision to withdraw, I think, was the, right, was the right one. But by the same logic, though, all the more important is vindicating our Asian alliances vis-a-vis -vis Beijing. This is because if the U.S. balks at defending, say, the Philippines, which is an archipelago in the Western Pacific under the darkening shadow of Chinese power, well, what should Japan take from that, which is also an archipelago in the Western Pacific under the darkening shadow of Chinese power? Not to mention Indonesia or Vietnam or Thailand, which aren't even really allies. I mean, Thailand is kind of a fake ally. So this is, a, this is sort of, I mean, you, they're not dumb, right? And I mean, the way I think about this is kind of, I mean, there is a sort of an academic argument that credibility, there's two extremes to the credibility argument. There's an academic argument that credibility doesn't matter at all, which I think is kind of belied by normal experience. If you want to get a mortgage, you got to get a credit report, right? So obviously credibility matters. You need, you know, in human experience, you can't be sure how someone's going to behave. So if you're putting a lot on the line, you want to make the best possible judgment. On the other hand, particularly in Washington, there's this idea that, you know, uh, credibility matters everywhere, that if we don't follow through on the red line in Syria, that our position in Asia is going to fall apart. And I don't think this is right. I think countries will look more at the specifics. And I, you know, I analogize this a little bit like I don't recommend cheating at golf or tennis. But if you do that, you might still be able to get a mortgage as long as you have a record of paying your bills, right? People can sort of tell the difference between two different kinds of things. And but what they're really going to look at is, do you pay your bills? You know, if you're a real estate company, you know, a bank, you're going to say, does this person pay his or her bills? That's the big question. That is a differentiated credibility. That's what they're going to focus on. And so this is the, the analogy here is how we behave vis-a-vis -vis China and Asia is going to tell other countries a lot about how reliable we are. And that's going to be really important in their decisions. So this discussion, though, brings out the importance, I think, of our defense perimeter. Now, the idea of a defense perimeter sounds like a very archaic subject, but it's actually highly relevant because the U.S. defense perimeter represents those countries that we're committed to defend, those we've staked our differentiated credibility on. So who is in and who is out of this perimeter is really important. And the basic purpose of these alliances, again, is to make the coalition work. And the coalition's basic purpose, in turn, is to have a favorable regional balance of power to deny China its goal of regional hegemony. So we need enough states in the coalition to do that. And if some of those states need alliance commitments, then we need to make them in order to ensure that the coalition works. That's kind of how the logic goes. The problem, though, with our defense perimeter is that we face polar risks of overcommitting and undercommitting. If we undercommit and we bring in too few countries, the coalition will be too weak and China will have an open field and will become regionally dominant. And this could be a problem particularly in Southeast Asia. If we overcommit, on the other hand, we risk becoming an entangled in unfavorable and sapping wars that aren't that fundamentally important, undermining our strength and the American public's will. Think of Vietnam. I mean, at the end of the day, Vietnam was not central to the resolution of the, of the Cold War. And it almost broke the back of American support for even our position in the central theater, which was Europe at the time. Fortunately, it didn't, but um, you know, that's the danger. So where should we draw the line? Not to mention that it was a tragedy because it was, you know, but I mean, we, we can get into Vietnam if we want to, but uh, probably people know more about the Vietnam than I do. But so where should we draw the line in light of this? Now, some countries I think are pretty obvious. On the one hand, you can't possibly have a meaningful coalition without Japan and Australia. Now, on the other hand, Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan, as much as we might sympathize them, are too weak and too indefensible given their geography. Some, like India, may not even want an alliance agreement with us. They might be in, I think the Indians are likely to be in an anti-hegemonic coalition. They don't want an alliance. So, great. So the rub of the matter comes down to places like Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and a few others in East and Southeast Asia. These countries are significant economies. So if we go back to our map, they got a lot of lights on and important for geographical and other reasons, but maybe difficult to defend, given their proximity to China and China's growing military power. 
but how difficult, costly, and risky to defend? Now, this is a critical question, and this is a question of military strategy, of how to fight wars. So if we can develop and implement a military strategy that brings down the costs and risks of defending these more exposed countries, then we can bring more states into our perimeter without violating our core duty to keep the risks and costs for the American people proportionate to the importance of the interests at stake. So in, to put it in a little bit simpler terms, the right military strategy properly implemented will allow us to have a big coalition at a reasonable level of cost and risk underpinning the whole edifice. So before we decide which country should be in the perimeter, we need to understand what the right military strategy for the United States is. Now, this right military strategy for America, in my view, is a denial defense, hence the title of the book. A denial defense is one that denies China its ability to use military force to achieve its political objectives. In particular, it focuses on denying China the efficacy of its best military strategy. Now, we need to focus, in my view, on Beijing's best strategy, not its most likely or its most destructive, potentially, because its best strategy is the most gainful for it. That's kind of what it is. And thus, the most dangerous to our interests in real terms. China's best geopolitical strategy against the anti-hegemonic coalition is, again, the focused and sequential strategy, picking off members one by one until it collapses or in small groups. Now, best, Beijing's best military strategy to advance towards this goal is to use targeted military force against vulnerable members of the coalition, irresistibly imposing its will on the targeted state while avoiding triggering a full-scale intervention by the rest of the coalition. That's getting back to that point about how they don't want to precipitate a response like Hitler did, right? A, a massive and overwhelming response. So in light of this, Beijing's best military strategy in my assessment is a fait accompli against a vulnerable coalition member uh, like the Philippines, Vietnam, or above all, Taiwan. Now, a fait accompli would involve Beijing seizing and occupying one of these countries before the broader coalition could come to their effective aid. Beijing would then present the coalition with a new set of facts, try to do the far more difficult task of reversing these facts at great cost and risk, or accept the new reality and deal with it, like Russia, you know, Crimea is a, is a kind of a small example of this. Now, the problem is this is a very good and therefore very dangerous strategy for us. It's entirely plausible not only that Beijing could do this, it's actually building the military for use against not only Taiwan, but ultimately beyond. They're building what's called a power projection military very clearly now. But also that the coalition might indeed balk at the costs and risks of reversing this result. As you know, Robbie uh, would know better than I, I mean, freeing a, uh, a country like, uh, like a Taiwan that's already been occupied is going to be far, far, far more difficult than defending it in the first place in, 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 in general terms. So the fait accompli works best for Beijing because it leverages the respective advantages of both direct force and persuasion in, in the military strategy. So it uses direct force to subordinate the targeted country, but then prim primarily relies on deterrent threats to dissuade the rest of the coalition from, car from coming to the target's, uh, directive, uh, the target's effective aid. So I think <clears throat> this is important because people often think about, uh, well, couldn't Taiwan impose a uh, China impose a blockade or bomb uh, or cyber attack Taiwan into, uh, into capitulation. And I think uh, experience and history suggest that this kind of strategy is like unlikely to work. In fact, we have found, to our chagrin over many decades, that this doesn't actually work, that we bombed North Korea, we bombed North Vietnam, uh, we bombed Iraq before 2003, we've mounted an uh, you know, embargo against Cuba, uh, uh, and they failed. Um, and Hitler, in fact, found in 1940 that he tried a blitz and essentially a kind of an, a blockade of uh, Great Britain, and that failed. Uh, so this is kind of basically why you actually find few examples of countries, you know, aggressors using this approach uh, to achieve their goals, because when countries have the ability to use direct force, they do. They take it. Uh, and that's, you know, if I'm in Beijing, the lesson I take is don't mess around. Let's, you know, as Napoleon said, if you want to take Vienna, take Vienna. So I think in that context, Beijing would use direct force, including ultimately invasion of a target's key territory to get it con concede. Now, in the case of Taiwan, this would mean annexation to China, the People's Republic. But that, that's not necessarily, that's not necessary. Uh, China could ultimately use such a strategy against the Philippines or Vietnam without wanting to annex them. In fact, in this context, it's worth remembering 
that the United States invaded Iraq in 2003, not to annex Iraq to the United States, but to get it to do what we wanted. Similarly, Japan, or Germany for that matter, and done this a number of times in, in Latin America over the, over the decades. So just because China would use its military to directly invade another country doesn't mean that they're going to try to create a territorial empire. I don't think that's what they would want to do. But it would mean that they would impose their will. And we have built a military to do exactly this. This is why we have you know, a Marine Corps, amphibious forces, power projection, aircraft carriers, because we can go where we want and say, if you don't do what we say, we're going to land on your shores and, and force you to do it. We haven't done it all that often, but everybody knew that we could do it, right? So that has an important shaping fa uh, factor. <clears throat> At the same time, this kind of fait accompli strategy exhibits restraint, therefore, enti therefore enticing other coalition members to give up their targeted coalition partner in hopes they'll be spared. Now, if Beijing could make this strategy work against, say, Taiwan, it could replicate it against another vulnerable coalition member like the Philippines or Vietnam. And I think it would be probably incentivized to do so if it were successful. But I don't think Beijing would actually have to go after each coalition member, because if it could use it against a few states successfully, um, especially U.S. allies, paradoxically, given the central importance of America's credibility, that would very likely make the, co the coalition appear hollow and cause a run on the bank. So it would then essentially be kind of feckless, and Beijing would become the regional hegemon. So the pr purpose of a denial defense is to prevent this from working. And it does so by focusing on denying Beijing's theory of victory, if you will. It's a negative criterion focus on denying the opponent's goals, not attaining our own. But this is actually good because it actually is a lower bar. As long as our embattled ally can hold on, the coalition wins and China loses. Now, this may not be pleasant, but it should be enough because China is the one that will have to fundamentally surmount this threshold to succeed. So for Beijing's strategy to work, it first and foremost must get the targeted coalition members, say Taiwan, to give up. So it therefore must exert enough control uh, or do enough damage to, give, to get the country to give up its basic autonomy, its independence. And I think to do this, Beijing is likely to have to seize the targeted state, what I think of as key territory, basically its capital um, and heavily populated areas. Uh, and without invading, I don't think Beijing is going to have the leverage to force the target to give up. So for instance, people mention the islands in the South China Sea or the offshore islands of Taiwan, the Taiwan administers. But I think that's very unlikely that Taiwan is going to give up its autonomy because the Chinese seize Kimoi and Matsu, uh, or, or the other, uh, I forget its name, uh, but you know, is, is an uninhabited islet uh, you know, off, off Taiwan. Um, in fact, I think the reason that the Chinese haven't done that is probably because they realize it would backfire. But if, tai if China occupies Taipei and Kaohsiung and the island's populated areas, Taiwan won't have any choice. It will be forced into capitulation. And then we will face the awful prospect of mounting an incredibly difficult and uncertain and dubious attempt to recapture it. And unlike in World War II, when we were 10 times the industrial might of, Ch of Japan and the world's largest shipbuilding uh, center in the world, now, it's that, now China's as large as we are, and they're the, the, the capital of heavy industry. So. We can deny China's strategy in one of two ways. And, and again, we're, it, it, pays, it behooves us to really focus on making sure we get the basics right here. And that's because China uh, has to, uh, Beijing would have to both seize and hold Taiwan or another target's key territory. You know, if it can seize it, great. But if it can't hold it, doesn't, it's not going to do that much. So we can work on both ends of the spectrum. We can seek to destroy or de degrade or disable, damage China's invading flotilla and, and air armada. Uh, before they reach Taiwan, that would work on that seizing part. But we can also attack, and we and our allies can, in Taiwan and otherwise can focus on attacking and ejecting uh, uh, Chinese forces that, are, that do land uh, on Taiwan. Uh, and we can really do both. And which, which one to, to emphasize will be dependent on a range of military and geographic of, of factors. But the point here is to prevent China from seizing and holding that key territory. Now, if we can do that, China will be forced to give up uh, or escalate to try to reverse its defeat. In this respect, though, I think it'll bear what, what I kind of think of as a heavy burden of escalation. And this is a critical concept in my argument. Because both the US and China possess what are called survival nuclear arsenals. No matter what we do to each other, we can, the, each, the other can still launch a devastating nuclear attack on, on the other. So that's, that's hanging over this. So thus, while a war between China and the United States could escalate out of control, both sides would have the strongest possible alternatives to avoid this outcome. And so I think, therefore, any war between them would likely remain limited. We'd never know. But if a war did break out, both sides would have the, this, the most powerful incentives to avoid that outcome. So 
How that would be limited, though, is itself subject to strategy because the rules would not be administered by some impartial umpire. The sides themselves would set and police them and thus would be subject to deliberate action. But the bur this burden of escalation idea, think of it as, you know, it's, it should be intuitive from, from any kind of negotiation, would play a decisive role in forming the limits and determining the resolution of such a limited war. The side that could force the other to have to escalate in a dramatic way, thereby increasing the other side's resolve and drawing international support to it, would benefit greatly. So to be concrete, if China had been denied its goals in a fait accompli, it would face a choice. Now, it could escalate vertically by going nuclear, for instance, or horizontally by attacking more countries and more targets around the world, or it could do both. But neither of these would change the facts on the ground. And at the same time, they demonstrate China's aggressiveness and unreasonableness, which would catalyze Americans' righteous anger and thus harsh, harsh responses, right? If you think of FDR on December 8th, 1941, while eliciting greater and more active third-party intervention on the coalition's behalf. So I think in this sense, China would face a very bad outcome or a bad choice, right, where it wouldn't really have any good options. In theory, it could escalate, but it really wouldn't, I think it would actually have an effect almost like a boa constrictor, where struggling against it actually makes the predicament of the victim worse. Um, and in this context, our, I think our goal would be to give China a graceful way out, paradoxically. We would want to essentially restore the status quo, and we, this might actually take some diplomacy and even swallowing some of our pride to give China this graceful way out, but this would be the, this would be the ideal. Um, so this is basically what I mean by a denial of defense. Now, it's possible that we may not be able to fulfill this goal. And if that's the case, this could happen because of, because of our own lassitude, and we have not been doing enough. We have not been focused enough and implementing enough focus enough. And our allies, particularly Taiwan and Japan, have not been doing enough to build up their own denial of defense alongside ourselves. So in this context, the, how, will we, how will we be able to uphold the coalition if China would be able to seize Taiwan or in the future the Philippines in the face of our resistance? Now, the key in this context will be generating the greater resolve needed to do this and the resolve to actually bring the coalition's latent superior power actively to bear. So there's, theoretically, there's more power on the side of the coalition, but the question is, will it bring it? The big question is how. Now, my argument here is what I call a binding strategy. And this is basically to deliberately array and develop our and our partner's forces in such a way that China is compelled, if it wants to implement its focused and sequential strategy, to necessarily appear so menacing, aggressive, and ambitious that it'll actually catalyze the will of the fuller coalition to defeat its effort. Now, the logic here is to ensure that Beijing, by attempting to put its best strategy into effect, will make clear to coalition members that they're better off defeating it now rather than later. In a sense, it's to compel China to have to do what Japan did in late 1941, early 1942, which is to basically alienate everyone and bring everyone in against it rather than be able to salami slice its way to success. Now, if we do this right, China will see that it has no good way to put the focus in sequential strategy into effect, and it should be deterred. But I'd rather not get to that point. I'd rather have a denial defense. That's going to be a lot, a lot more prudent for us. Now, that's very hard, and we're not doing it. And the Chinese are a superpower of equivalent size, and we're continuing to act as if it's business as usual. So what are the implications of my argument for our contemporary defense strategy? And it's worth noting that the administration is currently, uh, I guess, doing or finalizing their national defense strategy. And I'm, you know, I'll confess I'm a bit worried that we're going to lack the focus that we need. In my view, we, we blew our chance to have a graceful transition to a focus on Asia. We had our chance over the last decade, and we, we blew it. So now it's kind of all hands on deck, and we're going to have to kind of, we're, we're pretty close to having to basically drop everything else. So the top priority for the American defense establishment must be to ensure that China cannot subordinate a U.S. ally or Taiwan in Asia. And, you know, if you can get Taiwan right, you get, you get everybody else behind it right. So the first priority should be Taiwan, because it's China's best, uh, best uh, target. And because if we get them right, we, we defend Japan and Australia by definition and the Philippines. At the same time, uh, the, so basically if you're working in the American conventional forces, you should be working on China and particularly Taiwan. And if you're not, you should be looking for a new job. That's my, basically my view. At the same time, and I said that publicly, I haven't gotten any face shots yet. I'm waiting for it. But I, I really think that's the truth. Um, at the same time, the United States should maintain a strong nuclear deterrent. And in fact, I think we're probably going to need to reexamine our nuclear modernization program because the Chinese are building up rapidly. And I think we need a nuclear deterrent to deter them both. And a focused but effective lower-cost counterterrorism posture. So we, we have to go beyond the days where CENTCOM could just ask for whatever it wanted 
and you know the special forces were the were the, the the most important group and they got whatever they needed in the mountains of afghanistan we need to look there's still bad guys out there who want to come and attack us at home we have to focus on those guys but it has to be done in a more cost efficient way and we got to offload a lot of the, of the responsibilities to our partners uh, and actually we've gotten we've gotten better at that so i think we're, we have a good basis for doing so so in my view based on realistic defense budgets we, and in order to best employ these now scarce resources, the United States should not size, shape, or posture its military to deal with any other scenario alongside a war with China over Taiwan. And this is very significant in the Middle East, but also in Europe. What this means is that the Europeans are basically going to have to primarily provide for their own conventional defense, which is, you know, totally feasible. <laughs> they can totally do it. Uh, and actually, it was the original vision of NATO, of General Marshall and General Eisenhower. So, you know, the reason we're probably more at fault than anyone else for this situation where they're completely, and the Germans in particular, are lacking. And I, you know, I don't think this issue is going to go away. It's unsustainable and it's unfair. And there's an easy solution for it. So I think they can do it. And if, and if at the end of the day they don't do it, well, the area we're going to have to take risk is Europe because Asia is more important. So this is the, I mean, these are the reality. And I'm afraid the administration is not being clear enough on this point. So in closing, this is a book about war, about preparing, for, about preparing for it, and how to win it at a reasonable level of cost and risk. Um, but I stress, and I think this is genuine, uh, the ultimate goal of the strategy here is deterrence and is to be able actually to come to a decent peace with China. In fact, an acceptable detente, I would say. Achieving this, though, at this point requires firm and focused action and accepting the risk and distinct possibility of war. Only if we go through that period uh, will we be able to get to a position of strength where we can have a decent peace? And I think this is, again, where I'm worried about where our, our government is going because it's saying that we can dual track these things, which has the tendency to uh, downplay the need for firm and focused action. We have to go through a period of tension and difficulty and building up our strength, which we've neglected for many years, in order to get to a place where we can, where we can have a detente. And that, uh, only that will get us the decent peace that I think Americans – uh, certainly deserve. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. The gentleman said, if I understand correctly, that if China were to gain control of Asia, that, that would not satisfy their appetite. They would look elsewhere, to Europe, to Africa, name another location, and they would seek control there as well. Is that a concern for you, Mr. Colby? Look, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of my argument, it's kind of, it's probabilistic, right? It's, it's sort of based on assessments that I, I think are inherently uncertain. And I mean, I think your assessment is, is, is as good as mine, right? In the sense that you could be right that, that the Chinese do pursue uh, territorial uh, ambitions. I just think my sense is that um, the combination of, of our military and economic power, even in an autarkic situation where we're largely in our own region, would be, and, and the distances involved to project military power would be very difficult, and the costs and risks for China would be very great. I agree with you. I think they would be, have a dominant influence, for instance, in Latin America and other parts of Europe, ultimately. So that I, all, I fully concede. I just think it's unlikely that they would actually try to directly invade us because we will still be so strong. But my point is it's still going to be terrible. It's not what we want. And so it's possible you're right. I don't know. I mean, you could be right. I mean, who knows? They don't, they don't, they don't even know, right? Because they, they, they would only know once they were there to make the decision, you know? So, um, but I also try to make, you know, I'm trying to think about it in a way that I'm, you know, I kind of keep, if you will, keep the argument as tight as possible, kind of like the, um, the sort of most parsimonious explanation, because I think then, you know, you, you don't need to, we, we don't need, I don't need to be accused of exaggerating the threat to, for, for, I think, people to see what the consequences would be. The gentleman asked, is it not the case that in addition to investing uh, in DOD and counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, haven't we also invested in high-end capability which could be directed uh, in Asia? Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, so, no, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, actually, the 2018 National Defense Strategy took us off the two-war standard um, to, to one major war standard. Um, the problem is a bigger one, which is notionally on paper the strategy says focus on winning the major war and do everything else afterwards and adjust your military, the, the, the military forces that we have and the posture we have to deal with the problem. So the fact that I, that I 
went to the trouble of writing this book suggests to you how far we, I mean, not, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to carry on the argument because we haven't done that. So we've developed all these systems, but they're not actually optimized to do what I'm saying, right, which is what our political strategy, what I think the American people's interests require, which is let's be able to defeat Chinese aggression in the Western Pacific. Instead, we have, I mean, look, I'm not against aircraft carriers per se, but how do the aircraft carriers optimize, how does short-range aviation on an aircraft carrier, I mean, the, the current range, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the current range, I know you will, but the current range of, of, of unrefueled carrier, well, of, of carrier aviation today is roughly equivalent to what it was at the end of the, of the Second World War. Now, we all know those big carriers are vulnerable to missiles. Yes, they can survive if they do things that make them less effective, right? That's what the, that's what the Navy's been doing. Now, you would think the Navy of all the services would be the most invested in the kind of strategy, yet here we are. We have a huge army. What is that army doing in the kind of context that you're talking about? You know, now, the, this is starting to happen, but too late. The Marine Corps is the model here under Commandant Berger. The Marines have actually, they retired all of their tanks, which caused a lot of heartburn among a lot of retired Marines, which is probably a dangerous you know, venture. They retired a lot of their artillery. And what they're saying is we're going to now work out how we bounce around islands in the Western Pacific to sink Chinese ships, shoot down Chinese aircraft, make their life miserable, you know, fight them on, on these islands, Guadalcanal style. That's what we want. But they're running into a lot of, a lot of resistance. The Air Force is starting to move. But again, there's a lot of resistance and there's a lot of entrenched. So what I'm, in a sense, you know, the book has multiple purposes. But one of the things I'm trying to do is kind of drive the argument in a much more focused way where we're saying, hey, are you, and this is why, I mean, I kind of jocularly say, but I actually mean it. Like, if you're working on something other than defeating a Chinese attack on a U.S. ally in Asia, I mean, look, I think it's very possible there's a war in the next few years. And I think everybody who hasn't been trying to avoid it, whose job it is, to work in the military establishment in the United States is going to feel pretty, I mean, they should feel bad, right? I mean, that, and I don't say that because I have some moral superiority. I say it because, like, I think it might happen, and I really want to avoid it, and I hope everybody else does too. And this is, I think, how you do it. And I, look, if there's another, there are other arguments out there. I'd love to be, to see them in a way that isn't kind of hand-waving, because a lot of the counter-arguments to my book, to be honest, are like, ah, oh, you're exaggerating. You know, there's one argument in this meeting, um, foreign policy journal that was like, well, it's, we need more balance. And it's like, balance? Like, if you, have a, if you have blockage in your artery, are you like, well, I'd like to take care, you know, I'd like to get a stent, but I really need to take care of my tennis elbow. <laughs> it's like dumb, you know? No, 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 we're way past that. And this is the kind of, and I'm like, so I'm, I sound a little bit extreme, but it's like I'm thinking that in three or four years, there could be a war which we could lose and a lot of people will die. And I would rather avoid that. The, the drill makes two points. Number one, he believes that the principal threat today uh, is the climate change, uh, the climate change, and he believes that there are certain parallels between the USSR uh, during the Cold War and the United States today. Uh, just as the, the Soviet Union uh, overly invested in its military during the Cold War and, and not its industry, not its economy, uh, not its, well, we all know what the expected life expectancy for a man was uh, in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They ignored the health problems they, that they had. And he believes that we may, we, the United States may be headed in a similar direction as the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. Is that correct? Uh, I don't have well-formed views for a public audience on the climate issue. I mean, I have some instincts, but I, I don't, I mean, the only thing I would say is um, even if you think that the climate is a serious problem, it doesn't obviate international politics. So if you, you know, people are saying one of the arguments is like, oh, well, there's a pandemic. We, we, we can't be thinking about competition with China. Well, if you look historically, actually some of the most fundamental changes in international politics historically have been in the wake of major pandemics. I think the... Uh, I think the Islamic invasion, one of the reasons people think that, uh, well, I know the Emperor Justinian, his attempt to, uh, to re resuscitate the, the Roman Empire in the 6th century was really undermined by the, by the arrival of the plague. So, I mean, diseases happen, and they don't stop international politics. So if, if we want to be free, we have to be free even with international politics and, and changing climate. So, I just, you know, those are, those are sort of, they're not substitutionary, substitutionary they're sort of additive. Um, 
And on the spending issue, I mean, I, I just don't agree with the comparison to the Soviet Union. I mean, first of all, we spend roughly 3 to 3.5 percent of our GDP on, on defense in the national security state. The Soviets spent about 25 percent, I think. So much, much larger fraction. In fact, historically, comparatively, you know, the United States was spending, I think, 7 percent during the Reagan buildup. And, and uh, under, under Truman, it, we were spending up close to, I think, 12 or 13 percent. So by historical standards, it's, it's relatively low. Now, that said, I actually don't want to spend more on defense. I, would I think we can do this strategy that I was talking about to the gentleman earlier. Uh, within the current top line. The problem is that there isn't the political will to make the hard choices that are necessary to do it under the hard top line. So if I'm forced to make a choice between failure and spending somewhat more, and failure will definitely cost a lot more in the longer term, I'd rather spend more. So that's why I think the, the increase that the Congress is putting into the defense budget this year is, 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 is wise, especially because it seems to be focused on the right kinds of things. But I would rather spend you know roughly the same or even less on defense. But if we're going to do that, we have to make the hard calls. And that, that's just very difficult. And there are lots of reasons that people are familiar with. And we can decry them. But if they're going to just be part of the system, then we got to spend more. I mean, the Philippine military is a, not a serious actor. So, but if we've lost Taiwan and the Philippines, our position in Asia is, I mean, we've essentially, Japan has become isolated. And then, by the way, speaking of countries that are 100 miles from China, South Korea. If you, I think it's the Shandong Peninsula. It's, a, it's about 100, 150 miles. So all the capacity that China's building to invade Taiwan will, by definition, be available to invade South Korea. So, so, and, and Japan is also 5,000, 6,000 miles from San Diego. So this is, this is the problem we face, is all the important things are over on the other side of the Pacific. So this is why we've drawn it that the first island chain. And if we lose Taiwan, what are we going to do to compensate? We may have to go ashore, which we don't want to do. So, and then I, what I would say to this, the, the gentleman's question is, am I scared? I'm very scared. That's why I'm out here talking about it. Very scared. I'm very scared. I'm very worried. Because I am getting to the point where, thinking about it rationally, I'm wondering why they wouldn't do it. And I try to be a ruthless jerk for America. But if I were a ruthless jerk for China, I would be pretty close to advising China to go. Now, the thing that's holding them back, the thing that we have going for us, in addition to the difficulty of mounting and sustaining an amphibious invasion across a pretty significant body of water, I mean, is that, yes, they want to unify. The People's Republic has never administered Taiwan. But they want to unify. But they really don't want to fail. Because if you fail, first of all, your own neck might be, you know, I mean, you might end up like the last Ming emperor or whatever. You know, you, it could be really bad. And it's going to convince everybody else that it's, you, A, you're really dangerous, but B, it's safe to resist you. So China has, to, if I'm China, I want to be really confident. And given the difficulties of the amphibious invasion, and given, and I'm not just saying this because Captain Harris is standing next to me, that our traditional wheelhouse as a nation is aerospace and maritime power, not ground warfare. I mean, we're a democracy, we're high technology, that's our strong suit. This is a feasible problem. And what drives me crazy, what drives me crazy is that we can do it, we can do it without spending double what we want, but we're not. And so we're like walking with eyes open into a complete disaster, which is avoidable. And, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really, Xi Jinping, the Xinhua News Agency, the official Chinese agency, put out uh, in connection with this elevation of Xi Jinping to a demigod or what have you, uh, saying this is a man of vision and steely resolve and great determination. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this is what they're telling us. And this guy lived in a cave for five years. You know? Why are we not? And I'm, I'm out here, and people are saying, well, Bridge, you're a little extreme. You're a little extreme. Well, I, I think I might be not extreme enough. Well, I, I got it. We, have, we have arrived at the witching hour. I, 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 I have read this book. This is a really good book. And, and all the, the, the challenges that I, I just mentioned, uh, Bridge addresses every one of them in this book. I highly recommend it. Sir, we thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here.